I've captured a Bombus oppositus queen. She was crawling on the ground and she actually looks like a new queen that was produced this year. And so it looks like the colonies are going sexual. The time is 1124 in Marriage Meadow. She looks so beautiful and new. You can kind of see through here, there's no wing wear on her. And so she looks like a brand new individual. And then we just let her go. Most of us, when we think of bees, we think of our big charismatic bees, like bumblebees that are beautiful and hairy, or honeybees. But there's, you know, 30,000 bee species, at least globally, and those are extremely important as well. The general global estimate is that about 90% of our flowering plants require insects or other types of animals to transfer pollen. And bees globally are the most important pollinator. All of our favorite fruits require pollination. Apples, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries. So there is a global concern that pollinators are in decline. And especially some of our most efficient pollinators like bumblebees, many of them are in decline. That has severe consequences for the production of food. So one of the ways that climate change could be affecting bee populations is by altering their phenology. And so phenology is the timing of when something occurs. With climate change, we're seeing earlier snowmelt timing. What that means is when the snow melts earlier, flowers are gonna merge earlier and they're gonna bloom earlier. What we don't really understand is whether the bees are also gonna follow suit. Plants need the bees to transfer pollen from one flower to the next. Bees need the plants because they want to eat the nectar and the pollen. And so our concern is that if climate change is altering plant phenology and if it's altering bee phenology at different rates, we could have a situation where plants are available but bees are not active. That's going to be a problem for both parties. We've pinned about 4,500 bees so far this year. And so far in the entire project, I think we're on, uh, what is it? Oh, we're on 25,000. Yeah, a lot of pinning, a lot of bees. <laughs> in most of the research that's been done on phenology, a lot of it has been comparing historical records to contemporary records. What has happened? We're asking or trying to project what's gonna happen in the future. We have plots where we go in, in April or May, and we actually shovel the snow. This plot right here, this is where we uh, remove snow from. This yellow plant right here, Potentilla, started blooming earlier, and so it reached peak bloom earlier. We're trying to force plants to flower earlier than they naturally would, but what we're not doing is manipulating the bees to fly at an earlier time period. And so we're trying to create a phenological mismatch between plants and pollinators. What we then ask is, given that we've created that phenological change in the plants, do they experience any differences in terms of their interactions with pollinators? I'm going to go observe bees. <laughs> Bombus oppositus worker on Potentilla. Now it's flying. If our plants start to flower earlier and earlier, what impact is that going to have on flowering plants and their pollinators. Now it's flying and it's out of the plot. Our ultimate metric for how plants are doing are how many fruits they're making and how many seeds they're making. Once the fruits are ready, we go out and collect a subset of those fruits. We count them and then we count the seeds in each fruit. So what we're saying with this climate change scenario is if plants flower at an earlier flowering time, the bees are not emerging at an earlier flowering time, will our flowering plants be in trouble? 
If we had to try and do what bees do on a daily basis, if we had to come out here and hand pollinate all of our native plants and our agricultural plants, there's physically no way we could do it. And so our best bet is to conserve our native bees.